Hey everyone, welcome to Wrangle. We're just about to get started. If everyone can take a seat, please. Grab your drinks before you sit down. So I'd like to welcome you all for our third VIEW meetup of 2018. Uh, we do have two of our very own Wrangle staff here to, who prepared really great talks for you um, that I think are going to be interesting and informative. Feel free to ask questions. We're going to do a Q&A afterwards. Uh, also, we have members of our sales and talent team if here. If you're interested in learning about how to work with us or work for us, feel free to reach out and find us at the end. Um, and then without further ado, Jocelyn, you want to come on over? Thank you. Good luck, love. Phone's on silent. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good? Yeah. OK. All right, so what am I going to show you tonight? Nothing so far. Perfect. Matthew, can you get the screen turned on down here? Perfect. Thank you. OK, tonight I'm going to be talking about predicting the future with Vue.js. How many people here have wanted to know more about their future? <laughs> Thank you for the cheers. This is, I haven't even done anything yet, but <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm. Me too. So Peter F. Drucker was a famous consultant. He was an educator. He was an author. But he didn't know what he was talking about when it came to predicting the future. He's talking about how difficult it is. I read this quote and I thought, I could probably figure out the future. I know Vue.js. I have a couple <laughs> devices at home. I could probably whip something up in a couple weeks that could make the future a little less blurry than Peter Drucker thinks, thought it was going to be. I think he wasn't trying hard enough. So what did I want to build? Well, this future idea didn't come directly from my head, although I want to take credit for it and say it did. When I was a kid, I had a board game called Ask Xandar. Has anyone heard of this board game? Yeah? Don't worry, you're going to know all about it in 30 seconds after I play the commercial for you. So Xandar is a magical talking crystal ball that reveals all of the future to anyone who asks. So here's, here's what I grew up playing. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> here's what I grew up playing. Ask him, ask him, ask Xandar. Xandar, am I going to the prom with a geek? Please say no. Excellent chance. <laughs> You go to the prom with a geek? Okay, my turn. Do I have a secret admirer? Absolutely. <laughs> he knows everything. Ask Xandar. Wave your hand and he speaks. Guess what he predicts and the winner gets the special fortune bread. You will get a phone call about this. <gasps> Ask Xandar, the talking wizard game. Definitely. So that's Xandar. The most interesting thing about that commercial is her future is you will get a phone call about this, and then none of them answer the phone. They just let it ring. <laughs> anyway, so Xandar is really cool. It's basically a crystal ball with a little plastic figurine inside, and when you wave your hand over the top of the crystal ball, Xandar says one of I don't know, eight pre-recorded fortunes. And with what I know, I knew that I could build that. And I'm trapped on this screen. Let's see. There we go. So I knew Vue. I had a Raspberry Pi at home that 
was collecting dust in a drawer. I knew Raspberry Pi was cool. I knew Vue was cool. And I had an idea that I could connect the two of them somehow using things I knew and build a Xandar. So my tools were Vue, my Raspberry Pi, and I had an idea that probably the Pi and the Vue were going to need to talk to each other somehow. So I thought, I probably know JS. And this is it. I probably need a few other things, but I could probably get the whole project working together like this. These are my actual tools <laughs> once I started building things out. So I was right. I did need Vue. I did need my Pi. I ended up making an Express server. I used Jade. I used Browserify, which I'd never used before. I used Vueify to compile Vue and Browserify. I used Axios. I used SAS. I bought a Raspberry Pi kit for children, which was very helpful. I used Python. I used a motion sensor. And I burned through three HD cards because hardware is difficult. Also, I used Vue transitions, which I'll show you. So what did I actually build? Well, let me, let me reveal it to you. Huh? It's, it's just a bowl. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but let's see if I can get this mini camera game. Ah, OK, we're on. So this is the Raspberry Pi. And I've got some pins hooked up here. And this is a motion sensor. This is the entirety of the magic that's happening on this machine. Uh, I'll show you what the code looks like, but this is what the hardware setup is. How does this work? So uh, here's the thing. This has been running. I was nervous about it not working during the presentation, so I've had it running for like an hour. And it looks like it's still detecting motion, so we should be good. So, Xandar, will we run out of beer tonight? Well, the future's not looking good right now. just restart these two guys. So what I've done is I am inside my Raspberry Pi. Let's see. Hopefully inside my Raspberry Pi here. Motion detected. So I'm getting back into the Pi here. And you get to all watch the excitement of going through the file structure. So CD projects. And this is my motion script that's running off of Python. So what I'm doing right now is I'm making sure that motion can be detected, sensor is settling, and now it's detecting. Uh, and it's failing because I'm also, I also need to run the actual build. Pi at, so even though I'm on my laptop right now, all of the code I'm running is coming off of the Pi. So the Pi, I have my project up on GitHub. I pulled it down, and it, it, it's all living in here. Fortune teller. OK, so far, so good. So it's listening. And we'll run this one more time. OK. Fingers crossed. 
will this detect motion? I like having a tech audience because everyone's like, this is what you need to do. <laughs> ah! Okay, will we run out of beer before the presentation is over? <laughs> so, everyone, I'll give you a minute if you want to sneak up there and grab something. This is it. This is the, the entirety of the project. I'm using Vue on the front end. I am sensing motion on the back end when the motion sensor fires and it's <laughs> It's very sensitive and I'm very talkative with my hands. It gives a result. Like that. <laughs> okay, so one other cool thing about this. Let me actually screen this. Your future also has server-side rendering, which is really cool. I'd never built anything with server-side rendering and view before. And this has both. The way I've used Vue in the past is I've used Vue CLI to build things, uh, and, and then I just typically use everything on the client. I don't use anything on the back end. Um, but Vue can be isomorphic. It can run on the server or the client, which is something that has been built into this project. The advantages of using server-side rendering, one of them is better search, search engine optimization, which is really cool. Not really a concern for me building a fortune teller for my house, but if I was building a bigger project, that would be something that I would take into consideration. It's also faster. You're able to render things much more quickly than if you're doing client side. Uh, some of the disadvantages and some of the things I hit when I was putting together this project, some libraries don't work without polyfills or middleware. And one thing that I wasn't able to do with this project was compile it the way I wanted using Webpack, which I'll show you. Uh, I had to use Browserify instead. That was another piece of the puzzle that took a little bit of time for me to get up and running doing. Uh, and also, some lifecycle hooks in Vue don't work with server-side rendering. So if you're familiar with Vue lifecycle hooks, you might use mounted, you might use on create or created. Mounted does not render server-side at all. Also, your destroy hooks don't work. So if you put something in created, which does work server-side, and then you think you're destroying it using your destroy lifecycle hook, you're not. You're not killing it. It's a zombie. It's living forever. So you have to keep that in mind when you're building code. So the code. This is what the code looks like. Let's see. So I installed, let me make this a little bit bigger. So I used an express generator to get this build. Um, I also instantiated view. I used it like this. Uh, I'd never built anything with Express before, so there's, there's a lot of learning happening in real time on this project, not only trying to get the motion, but making sure all of the code worked as expected. But those of you who have set up a view app before probably recognize the syntax. Here's my app, uses the component app. And over here, let's see. In my app.view, this is just the traditional, here's my template. It looks for the ID of app, and then it inserts my component, fortune teller. Actually, I actually have two components that I used for this project, but only fortune teller is used in the app. The fortune teller component uh, brings in the second component. And then I've got on here, on this screen, I've lost my mouse a little bit. There we go. I've got my script, and then I've got some styles at the bottom. Please don't read into my styles too closely. If this was a project going to production, I would, uh, I would have someone review these styles before I took this project to production. <laughs> these work, and they work really well for a POC, but they could be uh, cleaned up a little bit. So the actual view piece. This is probably familiar to most people who have used Vue before. This setup, template, script, and style is the same setup that I showed you on the first view screen. This is where the magic happens. So how does this work? 
it's, it's still picking up motion. Nah. So, <laughs> the inner piece that you will see getting detected, these motion sensors, by the way, are so sensitive. Internet tutorials were saying, oh, if you want to turn on the lights when your cat walks in the room, you can use one of these things. And I thought, yeah, that's what I want to use. I probably should have picked something a little bit <laughs> less sensitive. Anyway. The pink words that are coming up, that is a single view component, and the rest of it is the other view component. So I'm, I'll take you through the outer one, and then I'll show you the inner one. So the outer component here has my title, which is the Ask a Xandar text, and then it's got the inner component, which I'll show you in a minute. This is the piece that shows the actual fortune. Wrapping this is a transition which is really cool. How many people have used transitions in Vue before? If you've used them, you know that they're pretty straightforward to use. The way transitions work, they work on conditional rendering or conditional display. So if you, if you use uh, vif or vshow, you can wrap a transition around whatever element that is. It's really straightforward. Any element that you want to hide and show on the screen, you can put transition tags around it and then you can animate it. Not to be confused with animation, which is also very cool, but transition tags. So the way this works, I give my transition a name, which is fade, and then down here in my CSS, please don't look too closely at it, I can define my animation down here. So this sets up what I want the animation to do on enter, on leave, and while it's active. And in here, I can play with the timing of things. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm rotating the text into view, I'm changing the opacity, and I'm changing the timing as I go. There are much more complicated transitions you can do. You can find simple examples online, you can find really complex examples, but it's a really cool way of making your app look really dynamic uh, with relatively low effort. All you need is if or show, and then your transition sandwiching it. So that's how the text appears. But where do your fortunes come from? Where is the magic? How does that happen? Let me show you. Down here in my app.js, I have this API method. I've got app.post and I've got uh, an endpoint called motion. This is almost the entirety of Sorry, you keep picking up my breath in this. This is almost the entirety of all of the magic on a pie. What this does is two things are hitting this endpoint. One is the pie and the other is my view script. So the pie, when it hits, if the request body message is pie, I know that it's coming from the pie and I set a flag called is motion to true. If I don't get that request body with pie, I know it's coming from view and then I check for motion. Check for motion is a separate method, and all it does is it reads the flag that I've previously set. So the pie always sets the flag to true, the view always sets the flag to false, and then when the view reads, it sees if anything has been set recently. Otherwise, it doesn't return anything. It returns detecting. There is probably several other ways of doing this, faster, smarter, better ways, and I. If anyone has any ideas and you want to talk to me afterwards, all ears. But for my PFC, this was all I needed. All I needed was a true false flag and to be able to read it. So then back in my fortune teller, the way I'm doing this is I'm mounted, I'm setting, I'm setting an interval, and I'm just pinging for data. Every second, I'm hitting that API and saying, is there a flag? Is there a flag? Is there a flag? Again, if this was production, I'm not sure if this is how you would want to approach things. But for a POC, it was an easy way to get a result. And like I said before, the mounted hook will only be executed on the client. So I'm using a side effect. Side effects should live in lifecycle hooks like mounted. But I know that I can't destroy this using on destroy. If you add something unmounted and you're using server-side rendering and you think you have destroyed it, you likely have not, so be aware of that if you're attempting to do something like this. 
the final piece of magic, so let's say I load my data, I hit motion, and then I get the result of motion. Then I'm going to set my fortune value. Sorry, your future is actually random, is the truth. So your fortune variable, I have this tiny little line here. All I'm doing is I'm generating a random number from 1 to 100. And in truth, your actual future is determined by a giant switch statement. So in my fortune text, what I'm doing is I am getting a fortune number. It's coming down from the other component. If the number is any one of these values, 15 or less, 30 or less, I return different results based on what, whatever the number is. All this component does, it puts your fortune in fortune text in an H2 tag. And this is used inside the fortune teller. And that's how you get your fortune. It, it is how you get your fortune, despite what you're reading on the screen. So that's the code. Let's go over here. So future improvements to this. There are many things I could do to make this better, cooler, faster. One thing I don't have right now, right now I'm running two commands. I'm running a Python script, and I'm also running everything else. I want both of my scripts to be combined into one, and I feel like that's a pretty fast, easy thing to figure out. If anyone from Wrangle, Ben, I see you're nodding. You want to work on this tomorrow with me? That would be fantastic. Another cool thing, and I was chatting with Matthew, our AV guy at the back about this earlier, would be adding sound effects. My idea was, I know the Raspberry Pi has a lot of capabilities, and I know you can add speakers. I feel like that Xandar clip, those clips, are probably available on the internet. We live in the information age. I can probably get those. And uh, it would be really cool to get Xandar's actual, actual voice coming out when you're waving your hand. But there's also a whole bunch of uh, speech-to-text rendering, things like that. There's the possibilities are endless. I would like this to talk next. Sometimes there's been uh, a timing issue, which you didn't see tonight, and I'm very happy about, but occasionally two fortunes blink instead of one. I call those the good luck fortunes, but really they're bug fortunes. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to get that figured out as well. And finally, no studies have yet been done on this. I don't know how accurate this is. I assume it's 100% accurate 100% of the time but maybe an empirical study would be like a safer way to, to go. If you want to see all of the code, you can find it at GitHub uh, under me, Jocelyn Jeffrey at Fortune Teller. You will also be able to see all of the commit messages I did from like 11 p.m. till 1 a.m. And those are, some of the names on those are fantastic. <laughs> Take a look. Uh, but that, this is what I'm thinking for the future. So hopefully, from this short talk and demonstration, you've learned that trying to predict the future is easy. All you need is a Raspberry Pi, view, and a couple other things, and wire it all together, and you too can create your own Xandar machine. Special thanks to Luke and Michael, who both aren't here tonight, but both spent hours of their free time helping me go through this presentation and trying to debug earlier iterations of this project that use a temperature sensor that never ended up working. Um, so thank you to both of them, and thank you to all of you. If you want to find me, I'm on GitHub, and I'm on Twitter. Thanks.
So while you guys are waiting, if you tweet Wrangle IO, I have 10 view t-shirts for the first people to do that. And then show me their tweet. I'm sitting in the corner back there. So you can do that until Evan's ready for his talk. It's good. All right. Uh, I'll start in just a minute or two to let the people grabbing drinks and whatnot kind of get done and settled. Um, yeah, and I guess who has tweeted to try and get the view shirt? All right. Nice. So, All right, um, so just as we're waiting for people to kind of settle back in, um, I was just wondering, uh, how many pe 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 people here have had a chance to try out Vue, e either kind of doing like a basic hello world, uh, um, a show of hands, like if you've had a chance to like try Vue, do something basic like hello world, awesome. Um, how many people are here have used like either Angular 1 or Angular 2 plus? All right, and React? Yeah, and for, I guess, uh, what other tools and frameworks are, are people uh, using? Am, is there anyone here using, uh, like, Cycle, Ember? No? All right. Um, <laughs> hey, don't laugh at Ember. It's good. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, yeah, because I was wondering just kind of like how much into the details of like the view binding and basics that I'd have to go into. Um, I'll talk a bit about those, but I guess to kind of get a start is my name is Evan Schultz, and I am here to talk to you about uh, creating beautiful data-driven interfaces with Vue, um, and basically. Rainbows, uh, because one of the things that I like about Vue is that it's very intuitive to use, and there's a number of things uh, within Vue that just kind of work how I would expect, and I don't have to jump through hoops to do that. And one of the, of the things that uh, it's made really easy is to do these like data-driven um, UIs. So to kind of uh, go over a bit of what I'll be talking about uh, for the next half hour, 
is first is kind of going over what do I mean by a data-driven UI? Because most of our, of our applications, we're talking with APIs, we're getting data. I'm like, so isn't that data-driven? So I just want to kind of clarify what I mean by a data-driven UI. After that, uh, I'm going to go into kind of the building blocks of dynamic components with the special uh, component called component within Vue that kind of uh, has a lot of a I think unappreciated hidden power behind it. Um, and I'll go over a, a bit of its basic use, uh, how props and events work within uh, the view component and in relation to dynamic components. And after that, kind of once uh, I've gone over kind of like the building blocks of what I mean by a data-driven UI and how the kind of special component is works, how to take those concepts to build it up into a more complex solution. So. What does it mean to have a data-driven UI? And for me, it's, it, it's when we don't know what components that, uh, that we will need on the screen until the runtime of the application. Um, and the reasons for this could be uh, numerous. Maybe you want to build a, a form based on an API response. Maybe uh, you're doing some sort of, say, like wartime builder, and there's application state that you want to generate the UI off of. Um, basically, any kind of data-driven confi uh, configuration within your applications. If you've ever had a feature request of like a person asking, oh, could you create a screen where I could add like two or three fields to a screen, it should just be easy. And then you kind of like, oh, but I have to go and add like a million different things. Um, so it's the idea where you don't know all of the configuration rules um, and components that, that will need to be dis displayed until the application is actually running. So when would you kind of need this? And kind of when I, I was kind of preparing for this talk and also a related blog post, I was doing a search for kind of um, uh, like what other material uh, was out there on dynamic co components in view. And I found one blog post that said, dynamic components are not a required, are, are, are not a common requirement. And for me, this is one that I kind of sort of disagree with, because while the requirement itself might not be stated, I, as a user, I want to have a dynamic component displayed on the screen, uh, unless you have a really bad PO. Um, it is more, uh, it can provide an elegant solution to many problems or features. Um, for example, if, you, if you're building, say, a workflow builder where people can like, select, select steps in a workflow and you want to be able to, to build a UI for that, it'd be very handy. If you want to add personalization uh, to the application, either through like a user can configure what they want to display on their dashboard or maybe experiments in machine learning to, to try and create a customized UI. Um, or if uh, you're doing lots of A-B testing uh, within the, the application, and some other service like say Optimizely or is trying to say, well, load like this experiment or this one. Uh, there's lots of, of ways uh, that this could be useful. Also, um, if you have any kind of like data-driven customization, either um, if you have say a user adding fields to a screen or if you kind of maybe have like a white label or software as service solution where like 80% of the screen is like exactly the same for every client but there's, there's like three or four fields that every client wants to be slightly differently, and you don't want to like rebuild those from scratch, uh, this is a, a good use, use case for that. And probably one of the most common ones that I've kind of uh, run, uh, run into myself is being able to dynamically ge generate a form, either through just a JSON schema, uh, or if you're doing uh, having to, to talk with an API that, that's telling you what fields and, fields and questions to ask, any kind of quiz, and, engine. Uh, this is a very common use case that I've probably run in, into on more projects than I can kind of uh, uh, count now. And for me, I think this is just scratching the surface of what this could be useful for. And, th and a larger part of that is because Vue makes it so easy that, you're that, that you don't really have to think of how do I do dynamic components, but what types of things can I solve with them. And basically, the idea is that you have data and state that you want to transform and then generate a UI based on that. Basically, you have a schema 
that you want to transform into a form. Um, and this is not the prettiest form builder ever. Uh, and what I, I kind of talked to in this demo, um, I'd say it's not a production ready form builder, but it kind of demonstrates uh, kind of how easy it is to, to get uh, going with, uh, with dynamic components in view. So now that I've kind of gone over a few of the use cases where I think this is applicable to, um, I'm going to talk about kind of like the basics of what the component component is within Vue. And if you go to like Vue's official documentation, it says sometimes it's useful to dynamically switch between components like in a tabbed interface. The above is made possible by Vue's component element with the is special attribute. In the example above, current tab can contain either the name of a registered component or a components option. And that's all you need uh, to know about dynamic components. And I guess I'm done this talk now. Six minutes, fast. So if that's all there is, why am I so excited? Um, and basically, for me, I love this GIF. Um, <laughs> is basically, it's so easy, it's almost boring. Um, and if I hadn't felt the pain points in other frameworks or tools of how to accomplish this, it just kind of seems like I would expect things to work this way. Um, kind of doing dynamic components in React is a bit easier in Angular 2+. Plus. Um, I have many years of experience with Angular, both 1 and 2. And within a few hours of learning Vue, I was able to build more complex dynamic form, loader, uh, like form builders than I kind of know how to do in Angular right now. Um, I know the number of blog posts I'd have to read and the APIs I'd have to go and, and refer to. And it's a lot to kind of keep, keep in my head. And so one of the reasons why, why this kind of excites me a lot is the fact that it's kind of boring. Because it just works how I would expect it to work. I don't have to jump through, through hoops. And it kind of works quite um, well. And this allows us to, to spend time building solutions that can, that, uh, can leverage dynamic components, not trying to solve the problem of, well, how do I dynamically load a component? So kind of as the documentation said, uh, there is a component in view called component, and it is simply a placeholder uh, within the application. Um, so here, basically, I have like a markup of a section, then the component is a active view, and I'm also passing down a V model. Um, v model is what kind of enables like the two-way uh, data binding for forms within a view application. I'll go into more details about that uh, later on. Uh, but one of the nice things about this is that it's, on it's only a, a placeholder, and it does not introduce any other host elements within the application. And to kind of, because uh, I don't always trust myself to have dev tools work properly, I have this nice uh, recorded animated GIF. And what I'm trying to kind of show here is as I'm switching between the, the two different comp component types, there's no kind of like extra tags being wrapped around that special component tag. So if you're doing layouts with, uh, say, like Flexblocks and, and that, you don't have to worry about uh, kind of the parent-child relationship uh, being broken. Uh, another scenario that I've talked with people about that they found this uh, very handy is if they're working with SVG um, because you're not getting kind of this extra stuff kind of uh, polluting your DOM. Um, and it kind of, yeah, I find it, it just makes things like styling and that a lot easier uh, and, and a lot more pre uh, predictable. However, the real kind of power of the uh, component comes from the is attribute. And the is attribute can be bound to a property that you've passed into the component. It can be a data property of the component. Or it can be a computed property or even derived from the Vuex store. And if you have not uh, had a chance to use uh, view much yet, is basically uh, for props, 
similar to, to inputs in Angular or props in React. Uh, they have the idea of like that you kind of like pass props down. Uh, you can also emit events up. And props are basically just the data, the data that you want to pass into a component. And also, uh, for Vue, um, if you have not used Vue yet and are kind of wondering what is this there, that is kind of a short form of saying vbind active view and saying this active view, I want to bind to this value here. And what this does is basically allows us to kind of swap between uh, my address details and my contact details. And this value is being passed down as a prop into a child component. And that's kind of fairly handy. Uh, however, where I think a lot of the power starts to kind of uh, surface with uh, the is attribute is when you're able to, to bind to a computer property that makes use of the reactivity system within Vue. And basically, with uh, what Vue does is, is it keeps track of all of these computed properties and checks to see what values that it depends on. And then any time one of those changes, it will go and rerun this function. Um, but if I had other data here that was not uh, being called here, those could change, and this would not get rerun. So this will kind of keep track of, like, oh, I'm now relying on is contact. It's going to see if is contact changes and then update the value. And I kind of cut this simple. Uh, so I don't have to do a half hour talk on just the reactivity system within view. But how this kind of plays out. is as I'm cha changing kind of um, the property of is con contact to true or, vol or false, the computed value is changing from contact details to address details. And then you can kind of see how the rest of the UI is updating, it's loading the correct component in its place, and you're able to kind of uh, toggle between the, the uh, two. So that's kind of like the bare bones of uh, kind of the component and the is. Uh, next, I'm going to be going into a bit more about props and events and how they work within the context of the dynamic component. Because dynamic components don't live in isolation. They, ideally, they should kind of communicate with the world around them. So props can be bound just like any other component within your application. And one of the things that I guess I want to try and get across here is that just because you're using a dynamic component, you don't need to learn all the, these extra APIs to be able to, to work with it. Just kind of how you would expect them to work, it does just work. So in the example that I was showing, I had a contact view and an address view. And they're all kind of maybe pulling in from the same object. Apparently, street one's really popular for all fields. Don't mind that. Um, and to kind of toggle this between uh, as a dynamic component, you could just do component is active view and bind every one of these props to this tag here. And th the nice thing with this is if, say, contact view does not know about street one, street two, country, and so on, uh, when contact view, uh, w when the contact component loads, it's not going to complain about any unknown attributes. Um, and if you've kind of seen, errors in Angular, but before, if you try and put an attribute onto a component that it does not understand, you'll kind of see during like, the AOT build time, like, oh, unless you do like schema, something registered to like, make, like, you kind of have to do a few extra steps where Vue will just allow you to add these extra properties, and they'll be passed down as attributes to the child. So here's where I have the contact props and the uh, address props, and well, this is nice and explicit, and you can kind of see exactly what's being passed down, and I fixed the error where I'm now doing street one, two, and the other is not just street one over and over. But you kind of might be wondering, well, if I have these like dynamic components that are being loaded from an API, I don't necessarily know every property that they need or, or, or what is being required. Do we need to know all of the properties up front? And thankfully, the answer is no. 
there is a feature with the property binding in view called vbind that allows you to specify a object and any object, uh, pro any kind of like uh, properties in the object that match the properties in the component that, that, get, that gets loaded will be passed down as props. Then, then the ones that it does not know about uh, will be available as attributes. And what this allows you to do is go from this really explicit and verbose uh, vbind here and basically that then do vbind is active view, well, component is active view, vbind, and then just the object name that you want to pass in. And this kind of cleans up your templates a lot. And as I was going through this, I was like, well, what happens to this extra props? Do they just vanish? Are they available? So I'm kind of going through a few of, of the questions I was asking myself as I was kind of exploring this topic. And they will be available in the ATTRS, or or, uh, which is short for attributes, uh, property of the component that is loaded. And there are two behaviors uh, that Vue will, will have. Um, there is the default be behavior, uh, where in your component de definition, you can set inherent uh, attributes to true or false. The default uh, behavior is true. And what this means is that uh, they will be kind of like fall through and become attributes on the root of the component that is loaded. Um, if you change this flag to false, is they don't kind of automatically fall through. They're still available in, a in the ATTRS, um, but they're not just automatically applied within the ADOM, and you can have uh, control over how and where they are bound. So to kind of make this a bit more clear, uh, this is just showing the default behavior where the contact props are here. Or the, well, these are the unknown uh, props of, of the, the contact, and this is the kind of markup of the address uh, component that is being loaded. And you can kind of see how these just kind of get applied as onto the root uh, node of that component. And there are times where this could be uh, the desired behavior, especially if those properties might be, be, be picked up by a third par party library that's looking for attributes on your component uh, for maybe things like a date picker or, or, or whatnot. However, at times that default behavior uh, might not be what you want. And all you have to do is set the flag to false and you can, can then control um, uh, where and how they are, are bound. And where this becomes really handy is if you're building kind of, say, maybe uh, reusable, uh, say, f uh, components or form building blocks. And if you want uh, the attributes to, to be bound to maybe, say, the input of that form and not the top level tag, uh, you can then, again, make use of the vbind uh, a TTRS. Then all those extra attributes will then get, get passed down to the um, the input. So if you had, um, if that object c c contained things like, say, read only, min length, max length, and so on, those would now flow down and be applied to the input tag. And this is also a very handy feature when working with other libraries. Um, and the demo application that I was building out, uh, I'm using Bufy, which is kind of a component library uh, built on top of Bulma. And I wanted to kind of like on the BE dropdown, just pass everything down and not have to explicitly declare every single property that it may or may not need. Because uh, then I just be kind of end up duplicating the, the Bufy B dropdown interface and that would be a bit tedious. Where I can say, no, I just want to uh, pass, like basically control where all of those fall down to and apply. Likewise, events uh, with uh, dynamic components work exactly uh, as any other one. Is they can handle any of the uh, DOM events such as click, focus, and so on, or also any of the custom events uh, that it might be emitting uh, within the application. One thing to kind of keep in mind is these events will be bound to the root, uh, the root element that is loaded. Um, if you want to take more control over that, uh, there's a bit more effort that you have to do that unfortunately I do not have time to go uh, into in this talk, but if you have any questions about that, um, feel free to talk to me after. So 
Now this has kind of uh, gone over kind of the basic building block of component is, uh, gone over how props are passed down, how we can handle events. And in isolation, I'm like, all right, this is kind of handy, but what else can I do and like why is this kind of handy? And so I, I started to build out a kind of a dynamic form builder. And the setup for this is kind of basic and it's something that I've also seen on a number of projects or close enough where you have a JSON schema, you want to iterate over a collection, and then ideally you want it to play nice with, v with vModel so you get the kind of two-way da uh, da two data binding so that uh, your form is actually um, useful. And the schema I have is basically an array with properties like field type. So these are the, com the components that will be dynamically loaded. And then kind of some common things like name, multi, true, false, options for a select field, and so on. Um, an example for the text input is this is kind of really bare bones, and most of the other ones kind of follow a, a similar pattern, so I'm not going to walk through each and every kind of c component in this demo. But I have the label and then an input or select or so on that takes in some of the extra values that are passed down. Um, so one of the features of Vue that I like is that it does have a templating language. If you've been kind of burned from Angular 1 and kind of like you want pure React and JSX and the idea of having a template language kind of makes you a bit scared, I can sympathize with that because I've been burned by that before. But the template language in Vue is nice, it's simple, um, and it is kind of uh, scoped within the context of that component. So if you've been kind of avoiding Vue because you don't like the template language, give it a shot. Um, I find it, it kind of takes care of a few of, a few of the like, rough edges of dealing with uh, front-end development. But one of the directives that it has is the V4. Um, and if you've used Angular, this is very similar to NG4. But basically, I'm going to go over each field in the schema and then use component is to bind to that field type and then just pass down any other properties to the component that is loaded. And the end result is basically being able to take that, that schema and, and build out a screen. And one of the things that is like, well, what about like VF or V switch or NG if switch? And because usually in past applications, I get into a spot where I just end up having this like VF in a massive block of things that I want to swap between. And this is still useful for simple use cases. Maybe if you have two co components that you want to toggle in between. But I find that this can start to quickly bloat templates. Too much logic starts to creep in. There's lots of repetitive code that can become error prone. And I was starting to build out an example of my form builder using VF instead of the dynamic component. And I got about this far before I got bored of copying and pasting and repeating code. So it's like, if it's just these two, that might be fine. But if you're having an application that might have dozens and dozens of components, and one of the really cool things is that these don't need to be a single, like, a single input level uh, one. I have an example in the repo that, that has a address component that is composed of smaller ones that is then loaded into a larger screen. Um, so you can get really complex here. And this would just kind of uh, turn into a nightmare to maintain after a while. But if you use VIF, it's nicely simplified for, for this. So even if you have a case where um, you're not relying on an API to tell you what to d display when. If you're getting into a case where you have these massive VIF blocks, th this could also be a use case uh, of, of where to make use of this. So, and what I've gone through so far, uh, there's no data binding within the VF form, and that's not the most useful form. So, one of the things that we want to do is have this form generator kind of like work nice with, with B model in the way that you expect. And Vue d does want to keep with like the idea of the one-way data flow within the application, where you pass props down, emit events up, um, and 
kind of when you're using the model, the intent of the model is to kind of deal with binding to the value of like your local component state, not your say parents component state. And the model is kind of just a bit of sugar on top of, and there's a bit more going on behind the scenes to handle edge cases. So this is a bit of a simplification, is binding a value to the input, then anytime it changes, saying that the local value is equal to the event target value. Uh, and this is how if you have a component that, that vModel um, allows for the two-way data binding. However, we want this uh, component to, uh, to work well with uh, the model. And for that, there's two goals that we want to have. One is to allow the parent to pr provide a value to the child component, and th the other is to let the parent know that the value has changed. And to accomplish that is one of the props that we're passing in uh, is value. So we're now going to bind value to, to the input here. And to let the parent know that the value has changed is we are going to use an emit. Um, and what this does is instead of trying to mutate the value of the parent, it's just going to tell the parent that, hey, the value changed. Here is the, the new value. And it's up to the parent to kind of say what it wants to kind of do with it. So within the, re so within the reusable building blocks here, there's a bit of work uh, to make things work nice with the model, but with all of the things that are then consuming it, you can use the model and not have to jump through any extra um, hoops. And so kind of in the form builder to have it uh, fleshed out to actually have the, the two-way Binding, we have the schema here that, that has the list of fields uh, and that. And what this is doing is saying, for each of the components that I'm, I'm loading, the model for it is going to be bound to a field here. And this allows us to fill out the form and have it be like, pre-populated with, with data. And as the user goes through and adds um, and, ch and changes data, the form data will be updated to reflect that. So. I'm going to quickly jump into a bit of the code. Um, and I need to mirror my screens. I used to know the shortcut to mirror instantly. So and yeah, so I have a demo here uh, I'll have a link to the source code um, on the last slide, um, and also a link to this being uh, hosted live. That kind of goes through a few of the th things that I've already talked about. And one of the things that, that I was playing around with is how could I maybe generate a kind of a, a form based off of a Vuex store. And Vuex is kind of like a state management uh, library for Vue, similar to Redux, but not exactly the same. But you still have the idea of a global state and um, getters and, and that to, to manage the application state. And basically, in the app state, I've kind of uh, defined the shape of the schema. If I want to empty out the schema for the contact and just erase all the fields, nothing's showing up. And a few of the other ones are being derived from the same Yeah, and I've intentionally added a, de de a delay there. Uh, things don't need to be that slow. But this is showing how you can kind of start to leverage uh, being able to dynamically build a form off, off of a view. And these are kind of the d different types of inputs that I've created a thing for. And I was going to say add the op options yes and more yes and add the field. So if you have an like application where you need to kind of uh, 
be able to dynam dynamically build out a, a UI based off of, uh, off of a builder like this. This can be quite handy. Or if you're kind of wanting to maybe see how an application might look if you're using maybe a select dropdown like this versus maybe a more standard select list. And I'm going to switch toggle. And this down here is basically going through. I'm going to switch everything that is a dropdown to a select list. And that input there changes to interval dropdown. So even if you just want to kind of be able to quickly experiment with trying one type of component, component over another, you, you can do that through a data-driven a data way and not have to go into your templates and rewrite the template to try one thing or the other. And I'm just going to jump quickly into the form. And kind of the code that is driving the bulk of that form builder, as you kind of saw from the, the slides, this is a component that is building the screen from the view store, the kind of v4, and updating the v model. And a very cool thing with uh, dynamic components also is they can be. Um, Lazy loaded using the, uh, the import syntax. Uh, so what this means is that if you had a form that was not using one of these, those won't be shipped, uh, shipped to the client until they're actually re required. So if you have a case where you have like, all these dynamic com components that you want to load and are concerned about the first load per per performance of the application, to have that be a lazy loaded on-demand component, all you have to do is, instead of uh, importing it normally, is kind of use the, uh, the special, like uh, the ES6 import syntax here. And this will allow it to be loaded on demand. And where this is nice is in the and the nice thing with that is it is that then in the consumers that are using this kind of say from store, is I get to provide the schema name and the model, and I don't need to have every single possible component here because that's been delegated to the form generator. Because if you had this like dynamic form and every screen that you wanted to make use of it on, if you had to import every single component anyways, that starts to defeat a bit of the uh, benefits. But if you can kind of say encapsulate like that within like your workflow builder, form builder, or so on, that becomes now one spot where you, where you have to kind of let the application know that, that those are being used. And uh, then they are also only loaded on demand when they're actually being visible on the screen. So that is all for my talk. Um, the repo uh, is available on my GitHub. There is a demo online that you can kind of uh, poke around with if you want. And then also, if you have, um, if this kind of got your interest in, into how to make use of this a while ago, uh, I did a blog post that does a bit more of a tutorial follow st step by step uh, process. So if you're kind of like, this has you interested, but some of the code examples are kind of maybe a little bit too much in isolation. Uh, there is more of a tutorial style um, blog post that I wrote on the Wrangle blog a while ago that goes through many of these same concepts and uh, in, a more, in, a, in a bit more of a step by step fashion. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Evan? One second, one second. Behind you. There you go. Hello. You talked about the V bind and you pass an object into that, and then all of the properties of that object get bound to properties in the component that's hot loaded. Yeah. But then there was also the colon if, which is, sh or colon is, short form for the 
vbind is, yeah. right? If the vbind object you do has a property called is, can you do that? Like if you just do one vbind and it's got a sub property called is and that would be the name of the component that it loads? I have not tried that. Okay. I will try that next. How's, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's it. And, w and once I try, I will tweet the results. <laughs> Any other? No? Cool. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. And guys, just before we wrap up tonight, we have uh, the organizer of UConf TO, Jillson Thomas, here, just to make a quick announcement if you guys want to stick back for a few minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Rangel, for uh, having this platform. So my name is Jillson. Uh, I am uh, a front developer and uh, Vue.js uh, community member. Also, I am a co-organizer of uh, uh, VueConf Toronto. And then I want to make uh, this announcement here. So we will be having uh, our first Canadian uh, Vue.js conference here in uh, Toronto. And that will be happening in uh, uh, Fairmont uh, Royal York, which is right behind this building, I guess. So that will be on uh, November 14 to 16, uh, 2018. And uh, the first day. 14th would be a workshop day. We have a uh, seven full day workshop uh, organized by the main uh, Vue.js team members, core team members, starting from the creator Evan Yu itself, and then other core team members like Chris um, and Eduardo, and then the creator of Next.js, the Chopin brothers would be here, and um, uh, the creator of uh, Vue.js, uh, John would be here. And then the next two days, 15th and 16th, uh, we'll have full day workshop. And we have close to 20 people from all around the world coming here and talking to us all about Vue and then all the related technologies. So all this information are available um, in the conference website. It's viewtorano.com. So feel free to check out the website. And the tickets are on sale. And especially for the uh, workshop, uh, we have one special uh, workshop by Vue Vixens. It's mainly for women and uh, people from underrepresented uh, groups. So it's com uh, that particular workshop is completely free. Uh, anybody uh, in the ever mentioned categories, feel free to just go to the website and then register for that event. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, the tickets are on sale. And we have diversity tickets available right now. So it's subsidized tickets for anyone um, in, uh, in the category of, I mean, who identified themselves as women or uh, people from underrepresented groups like uh, LGBTQ or people of color. Um, and uh, if, if you're facing financial crisis and all those stuff, you can apply for that grant. Also, um, if you're an independent developer, we have uh, the diversity tickets for you guys as well. Also for the student, uh, we have special student offer and uh, group tickets available. So yeah, I mean, uh, this is a great opportunity for anyone who is interested in Vue.js to just come to the conference and then network with uh, the creators itself. So thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'll be uh, available so you can just contact me. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you guys can network for a little bit, and then we'll see you at the next meetup.